three three uh, repeating, of course, percentage of survival. Well, that's a lot better than we usually do. Uh, All right, Elite, thumbs up. Ready, guys. Let's do this. Leroy Jenkins. Oh my God, he just ran in. Save him. Oh, gee, stick it clean. Oh, gee, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. God damn it, Leroy. Alright soldiers, let's get right into this. If you thought that the behemoth was going to be easy, you were absolutely wrong. If you've played an MMO to the end game before, then you can probably realize that this really is a raid boss with raid boss mechanics. First off, let's talk about his general things. The behemoth's hit zones are absolutely terrible on 85% of his body. You may as well be attacking a wall for all he cares unless you are hitting one of his three weak spots. His head, his tail, and the one that doesn't actually show up on his physiology, which is his front legs. The front left leg is where most damage dealers will want to stick for a reason I will go into later. If you engage Behemoth within a zone and then leave him there, he will begin to regain health. So make sure that at least one person is with him at all times. There are four zones that Behemoth will fight you in. He will always hit all four zones in a hunt, unless you happen to triple cart before that. The assumption will be made that each zone is for 25% of his health pool. Behemoth does not have a large amount of abilities, however the abilities he does use seem to change a small amount with the area he is in. Alright, with that basic stuff out of the way, let's dive into some abilities. Chib... Chibolib... Shurebrand... Tornado! When Behemoth casts this ability, you will get a little warning pop up on the side of the screen and his face will glow blue. Only one player can be targeted and the targeted player will have a little wind circle following them. There are three ways to deal with this ability. The first is flinching the Behemoth by hitting his head a bunch during the cast. This is great, but unreliable due to the amount of damage required. The second is the easiest one, but will probably also not be viable when extreme difficulty comes out, and that is flash pods. The cast time on the tornado attack is crazy long and flashing him will cancel the attack. This regular version of Behemoth can be flashed an infinite number of times, so theoretically you can just do this the entire fight. The last method, which will likely be required for the extreme version of the boss, and yes I am going to call him a boss because he is a boss first, not an animal, is for the targeted player to run across the wall of the room until they drop the tornado against it. These tornadoes last long enough to make Kushala blush, and are big enough to also make Kushala blush. You obviously don't want them anywhere important to the fight, so putting them out of the way against the wall is the smartest strategy, if for whatever reason you can't flash him. Charybdis will not be cast at all in Area 3 of the fight. The Meteor! This move is pretty straightforward at first glance, but if you, like me, had not looked up the fight beforehand, you may have been super, super scared when the word Meteor popped up in the little warning on the side of the screen and his face lit up blue, but, n but no, no, it, it isn't that Meteor. That Meteor has a different name, and it makes his face light up red. This Meteor works slightly differently based on the area and the enmity. In the first and third area, the Meteor will target a single player. In the second and fourth area, the Meteor will target every party member one at a time. However, if a player holds Behemoth's enmity, they will be the sole target of a Meteor cast regardless of the zone. When you are targeted, a little red circle will pop up where you were. Dodging won't help you a whole lot without a Vedic Sender as this hitbox is massive, so sort of like Charybdis, the only way to avoid it properly is to just run in a straight line until it's gone. I'd love to say that this next thing should be common sense, but I'm very afraid that it isn't. If you are targeted by the Meteor, run away from your teammates. There is no reason to run towards them and make them fear for their lives when they are not the ones targeted by the ability. The Comet is a move that you will desperately want to remember for a later point in the fight. Behemoth will light up blue, and then will target a player, and they will be followed by a ridiculously noticeable red line coming down from the sky. When the cast finishes, he will drop a large rock on said red line. This rock is your baby. Give him a name and do anything else you have to do to drive it into your head that protecting this rock is paramount to surviving the fight as a whole. The comets do have health and Behemoth can destroy them. You do not want that. In an ideal world, your fight would look like this shitty paint drawing. Charybdis in blue will be dropped on one wall. Comets in red will be dropped just next to the other. Behemoth will be fought in the middle. This would be to ensure that the comets are both safe from Behemoth's attacks and are a safe zone in general for hiding, as well as giving you the maximum space to fight Behemoth in the middle. 
the last move where Behemoth lights up blue is his Thunderbolt. It will make one bolt of lightning for each player in the closest location to each player within a cone in front of him. Meaning if you are in front of him, it will spawn under you. But if you were at his left side, it will just spawn somewhere in front of his left forearm. This ability is sort of the antithesis of the Meteor in terms of difficulty throughout the phases, as it just does not appear at all in Zone 1 or 3. The first move where his face lights up red is the Ground Eruption. This will not show up as a cast, but does have a little bit of build up time. Once his face lights up, he won't move. The eruption will always happen in a small cone shape in front of his face. The cone isn't very long, but it is quite wide. So if you are stuck in front of him, your best options are either to escape by getting out backwards, or by trying to get under him. The move that replaces Charybdis in Area 3 is a little unique. He will do a forward headbutt with his horns, which impale you and apply the bleed status. Then he will lock you into an animation where he picks you up and slams you into the ground a bit. Sort of like... Uni Hunter. Then he will throw you away after which you will gain enmity with Behemoth. Generally in this situation, you will be pretty close to death and bleeding, so you definitely want to drop it. The best way to deal with this is to have flashes ready and flash them while you're crawling away. If you don't have them, hopefully one of your teammates does. And now for the one you've all been waiting for, the Ecliptic Meteor. Exciparaz! This is a move prophesized to be the end times of all Monster Hunter, and honestly, it comes quite close. A little tidbit of information before we get too far into this, most items will not work while this ability is happening. So if you are hoping to Farcaster to safety, not only can you not cast Farcaster, but this thing can and will kill you in the camp anyways. The range is larger than a Russian grizzly bear, which are of course larger than normal grizzly bears. Remember those rocks from earlier that I told you to name and take care of? Well, you're about to be damn happy you did. You're welcome. This meteor will always fall from the same location in each zone, and in order to avoid the damage, you have to do one of two things. First, and probably the safest option, assuming you manage this ideal world that I mentioned in the comment section, is to run to the side and hide behind the comets. This is a straight up raid boss mechanic, and this attack alone is why I've gotten you to set up the room like a raid boss fight. The second option, which is fantastic for situations in which either the room is literally hell, or if you want to just look really cool if you nail, but really, really stupid if you fail, and it's the jump gesture. We got a new gesture with this series of quests, the Final Fantasy XIV jump, and the gesture has an actual hidden mechanic. If you time this gesture right, you can dodge the ecliptic meteor damage completely, and then you will be teleported to landing on top of Behemoth's face to do a nice bit of damage. The most interesting part of this is that the gesture does not dodge regular hits. Even a great Jagras bite will pull you down out of it. This is a specific interaction between the gesture and this ability that doesn't happen anywhere else in the game. Ecliptic Meteor will happen three times throughout a successful hunt, once at the end of Zone 2, once at the end of Zone 3, and then when he is on the absolute edge of death in Zone 4. The final cast will end the hunt, one way or the other. Ugh, oh, there we go. Now I'm behind a rock. Wait, why are you still out there? What are you doing? Yes! Other general moves he does are straightforward physical attacks. He shares a lot of animations with Nergigante in terms of arm swipes and little pounces. The one thing of note with his physical abilities is that most of them either come from his right arm or hit his right arm, meaning that his left arm actually becomes the safest place to fight him as a melee user. He has only a couple of animations that use his left arm, which means that he will, for the most part, just be safe to fight there. Just follow his left arm around and you'll be good. Behemoth does, however, have two animations that cannot be attributed to Nergigante, one of which is attributed to... Great Jagras. Yeah, that's right. He actually does this little fall on his face move that Great Jagras likes to do, and I think it's absolutely hilarious that he shares a move with him. The other physical attack that is unique is his big ass tail swipe. No, not that little dinky shit. This one. He spins his entire body in a circle of death that does an absolute ton of damage if it hits you. It does have a noticeable wind up if you look at his face, but god damn, this attack is scary! 
Now that we've gone through all of the attacks themselves, let's hit up the enmity mechanic. This one is super interesting. In the lead up to this fight, the developers told us in order to be successful, an average party would want to have a support, a tank, and two damage dealers. The reason for the tank is this mechanic. Let's start off with how you gain enmity. Enmity is gained by hitting Behemoth in the face enough to enrage him. Think of this sort of like a status. Each weapon seems to have, strangely, its own values for triggering this, as it's not the same damage for every one. For example, a lance can take enmity just as fast as a greatsword who focuses the face, even though one is definitely doing more damage than the other. An interesting point is that slinger ammo seems to be quite good for triggering enmity as well. Now for the best part, when somebody is holding enmity from Behemoth, he will not cast Charybdis. And he will focus most of his attacks on the person targeted by the giant red line coming out of his face. Fucking laser sights. The exception being Comet, which is still randomly targeted. During Enmity it is the ideal time to deal damage to Behemoth as he will generally be quite predictable. As mentioned earlier, the safest place to deal damage to him as a melee weapon user is the front left leg, which is also one of his weaker points. As a ranged user, stand wherever the fuck you want, really. I isn't that why you play ranged? If for whatever reason your tank has enmity and they are in a situation where they're about an inch from death, you can actually cancel the enmity in two ways. One being to apply a status, and the other is surprisingly by flashing behemoth. From a mix of my experience with the fight and a bit of theory crafting, the best people for the tank role should be the obvious lance and gun lance, the less obvious spread shot heavy bowgun with some shield mods, and the incredibly hidden gem of the crit draw greatsword. Greatswords are surprisingly good at generating enmity. They do a lot of damage, and a crit draw greatsword could still manage to do a decent chunk of damage while holding enmity. One last interesting thing that sort of relates to enmity is that the challenger mantle has no effect on this fight. The behemoth will simply pretend that you're not wearing it, and will continue to target his abilities as he normally does. The best support will more than likely, and also unsurprisingly, be a full wide range sword and shield build with a status weapon. Aside from the ease of access to healing while your weapon is unsheathed, you will also be the best choice for flashing behemoth out of something like Charybdis. If you are going to use elements, I'd recommend using Dragon as that is the one he is most weak to. As for the status weapon, Behemoth is equally weak to all statuses, and the triggers for the statuses seem to be significantly lower for him than for most other monsters. We're talking like 20 to 30 seconds into the fight from a single person using a weapon with that kind of status low, which means that spreading out statuses could actually give you some decent extra damage. An interesting note is that Behemoth's knockdown times are incredibly low. Whether from tripping him, which is possible by the way, or from mounting him, he gets up faster than any monster I've seen in the game, so don't put yourself in too vulnerable of a position if this happens. True charge combo will not be able to go all the way through with him on his back. As for mantles, I personally wouldn't touch a rocksteady mantle with a 10 foot pole unless you are super super confident due to the amount of multi hits this guy pulls off. But the temporal mantle is an absolute godsend for this fight. As a final piece of advice and an absolute last resort for people really struggling to finish this monster, if all you are after here is the armor and the weapon, which I would not blame you for, the armor is broken as hell, then you don't actually have to kill Behemoth. All of the materials can be gathered elsewhere, either from breaking his horns and claws, carving his tail, using the Palico Plunder Blade ability, or just from the special assignment to repel him. To recap, Behemoth only fights in four zones. Flash Charybdis, Dodge Meteor, Dodge Lightning, Dodge Ground Eruption, Place Comets in Good Places, and Protect Them! Ecliptic Meteor happens three times in the fight. Escape it by hiding behind a comet or with a well-timed jump gesture. Whew! Alright! Let me catch my breath a second, because there was a lot of information to go over with this fight. Personally, I think this is exactly the type of fight this game needed at this point. I said it earlier, but Behemoth straight up is a boss first and an animal second, which is just so backwards to how the game tends to work. But at the same time, having actually fought and killed him, the experience was just so heart-pumpingly intense that I'm so happy it is here. I think having a fight like this is fantastic. You don't want to have too many like this because it would just take away from what the game is as a whole, but having the one feels just perfect. As somebody who has raided in an MMO before, I found this experience to be absolutely tantalizing. 
working out the mechanics as I went into the fight, trying to understand what he did, and in the end, just accepting that you will spend at least as much time failing the quest to learn how to fight him as you will actually farming him. It all brought back fantastic memories, and while it is definitely different to the style that Monster Hunter has had so far, I think this might be one of my favorite fights in the game. Yes, he is difficult. He encourages a ton of teamwork, and fighting him is benefited ridiculously by knowledge of the fight. Having 10 fights like this in the game would be boring and pretty bad, honestly. But having one? Having one just feels so right. Alright everybody, like if you liked the video, subscribe and hit the little notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet.